to not say anything if you don't want to be in the recording. And um, for folks who haven't been on Teams in a while or haven't used Teams, there's a usually black and white control bar at the top of the screen or at the bottom of the street screen usually where you can mute yourself and turn your camera off and on and you can raise your hand and you can turn on live captions also you get to the captions by clicking the three dot dot dots that say more and scrolling down to language and speech and then if you click on that you get an option to click to turn on live captions as well um, during the presentation, feel free to put questions into the chat, but we're going to save questions until the end of the presentation. So if you want to raise your hand to ask a question instead, just save that um, until we get to the Q&A. Or you can save your chat questions till the Q&A also. And um, I will be monitoring the chat during the Q&A as well. So if you have any technical difficulties, you can feel free to be in touch with me also. OK, any questions like procedural questions or comments before we pass the microphone over to Eamon to introduce himself? All right, then I think we're ready to pass it over. Thanks so much. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad to see so many familiar faces and some new ones. Um, I don't know if you guys can see me. Can you guys actually see me on video? Yeah, all right, cool. Well, I'm actually not in my dining room. I'm actually in Bob Fisher's on Pool House. But, um, you know, he's pretending that I'm not by standing outside. Uh, but I'm actually in my bathing suit in, um, in his pool house. So um, today um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some updates to um, how things are going with managing residual materials in Vermont. And I'm going to talk a lot about Vermont, but I think this uh, presentation is probably very applicable to the region as a whole, if not the whole country. Um, and uh, as usual, we're going to spend a little time talking about our favorite friend, PFAS. And I tend to um, assume that a lot of people know a lot about PFAS by now, folks that work in the residuals management world in Vermont, the wastewater folks and um, folks who are managing sludges and biosolids tend to know a lot about PFAS. They, they don't necessarily want to, but they have to. And so, um, but I will try to pause a little bit and before I get too too deep into PFAS and, um, and we can maybe talk a little bit about what it is for those who are new to the topic. Um, and we can also talk about that at the end. I don't expect this presentation to be extremely long. I really wanted to keep some time for Q&A. Um, so um, what's going on in Vermont right now with residuals? And by residuals, we mean primarily wastewater sludges, septage, which in Vermont is a big one. We've got everyone hears this a lot uh, who works in our area, but we've got 55% of Vermonters at least on septage. That's an old stat from an old census, but that's still a pretty high rate per capita. We might be uh, per capita the most number of, of people on septage um, in terms of that 55% in the country. Um, it's pretty common up here in New England to have a lot of folks on septage, um, and it's typically managed at wastewater plants, but it can also be managed through land application. Another thing I'd just like to stay up front is that when we talk about sludges and biosolids, they are often used interchangeably, those terms, but they are not if you work in the field of residuals. Sludge is the solids byproduct of the wastewater treatment plant process. And biosolids are then created once you've taken that sludge and you've treated it. And by treated, I mean you've reduced pathogens and Vermont follows, like many other states, the federal government's rules on pathogen treatment. Uh, and, and that actually includes vector attraction as well. So anybody who does composting knows about vectors. Um, so you have to follow uh, the federal rules, but Vermont has adopted them almost straight up, with the exception of biosolids have to also meet certain pollutant standards. 
and those typically are 10 regulated heavy metals, um, kind of the ones you'd expect, the, the nasty ones, the lead, the mercury, the cadmium. Eamon? Yes. Just in case, um, we are still just seeing your title slide. I don't know if that is That's the okay. intention. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I'm giving a little backup. Thanks, Emma. Um, so basically, when we talk about biosolids, we, we have taken that sludge and treated it to a point at which the EPA in Vermont deems it safe for recycling. And typically, recycling occurs by putting it back on the land as a soil amendment. It's a very good fertilizer. Uh, it's really closing the loop. When you think about flushing the toilet and everything that goes down there and whether or not we put that sludge in the landfill or whether we treat it to biosolids and land apply it, um, those are really the only two options for, for managing this material. Um, and so, you know, this is all managed under the Vermont Solid Waste Rules, which I would not necessarily encourage you to read. But um, if you ever wanted to dig a little deeper on sort of what those pollutant limits might be or what the typical pathogen treatments uh, might be, uh, you could see them there. I can tell you that there are um, historically in Vermont quite a few municipalities making biosolids, and there's been quite a shift in, in, in that over the years, especially with uh, PFAS rearing its ugly head. So let me just jump in a little bit here on um, talking about where, where this stuff goes. So this is a lot of numbers. You don't need to take all this in. Uh, these are 2021 sludge and biosolids and septage stats. So on the top sort of boxes there, it's all sludge and biosolids, and on the bottom is, is, is septage. I just wanted to point you to a couple of very key items here. One is the term beneficial reuse is basically recycling, and that means it's going back to the land. So Vermont as a whole is recycling almost 72% of its sludge. And the reason that is such a high number, that is the highest it's ever been since I started working at the state. And that's over 10 years ago. So the reason that is occurring is predominantly because a lot of our municipalities are exporting sludge out of Vermont and it's being treated somewhere else like in New York or New Hampshire or Quebec and it's being recycled there. But once it's exported from Vermont, it typically does not come back. Um, people are trucking this stuff. Um, it's a very expensive thing to truck around. There's a lot of water weight. And so what we're seeing is, is once you've trucked it one way, all that distance, you really don't want to bring it back. You want to treat it or you want to give it away or recycle it where you where you are. Uh, another thing I'd show you is that, uh, and, that and that's represented by that number there, the 46%. That's the export number. So we're we're exporting almost half of our sludge out of Vermont. Uh, I'll just let that sit in. Um, and then at the bottom, we can talk very briefly about septage. Um, you know, we manage around 44 million gallons of septage a year in Vermont. So we track that every septage hauler who pumps a tank and brings it somewhere is supposed to report to us. And the wastewater plants are also telling us how much they're taking and from who. So we've got a pretty good, pretty reliable uh, way of tracking septage in Vermont. Um, that number 44 million is, is held pretty steady over the last several years. But what's changing is the amount of it that's going to the wastewater plants. It used to be that a lot of it, well, not a lot, but more of it was land applied in Vermont. Uh, and now we've got, what, 90, over 90% 90 going to our wastewater plants. So this is in addition to our wastewater plants taking, you know, sewage from the municipality that they're working uh, in, they are also taking in trucked waste. Uh, and there are, I wanna say about 20 wastewater plants in Vermont that can take septage. So they really need to have a dedicated septage receiving station and need to have staff who are there to keep an eye on things <laughs> uh, as haulers are lining up outside the gate. Um, and some of you on this call, I know, uh, have a lot of experience in this as treatment plant operators. Maybe we can maybe talk a little bit about that afterwards. Um, but it is a, uh, an interesting st statistic in Vermont to see how much septage is going to our treatment plants. Um, and we are actually embarking on a 
statewide septage capacity study any day now. Uh, the contract is, I think, sitting in our fancy DocuSign system waiting to be signed right now. Uh, and so I think what we're going to do is take a look at some of the stuff we already know, where our septage going, how's it being managed, but also getting some recommendations. Do we have enough capacity in our treatment plants? Um, do we need to incentivize some changes there? Can we help? Um, so that you can all hold your breath for that. I don't think we'll have results until at probably eight months from now. Uh, but we are taking a look at that. We talked about uh, biosolids and sludge management, and this is just me attempting to sort of show you what options exist for these materials. For example, um, if you have sludge in that first vertical column and you want to manage it, your options are not in the red and only in the green and maybe some yellow. So you can take it to the landfill, but I put it as yellow there because uh, it's getting a little more challenging to send sludge to the landfill and they have capacity limitations. They can't just take every bit of sludge that comes to the door there. They have to balance uh, the amount of, and let's call it simply dry goods, uh, I mean, it's typical MSW that's coming to a, a landfill and the wet stuff, the sludge that's coming in. Uh, we've had a very recent article hit the press out of Maine where uh, Casella's landfill Juniper Ridge couldn't take as much sludge as what was being uh, was trying to come in the door there. And the reason was is they claimed due to stability of the actual landfill. So you've got to be careful when you're mixing MSW and sludge in a landfill and you're piling it up and you're making uh, trying to make a, a stable area for people to work in. You can't have uh, things collapsing. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, you. In Vermont, we don't have incinerators, so that entire row there is red, right? We don't incinerate sludge in Vermont. There are other states who rely um, almost exclusively on incineration. There are incinerators in Rhode Island. There are incinerators in Connecticut, Massachusetts. There's one in New Hampshire. Um, you know, they are have historically been used and also have their own challenges. Um, they might go down for maintenance and uh, planned or unplanned, and that tends to push sludge in different directions. So sludge is going across borders. It's being managed in multiple states, uh, but Vermont being where we are, um, you know, we don't have incineration as an option. It's just not close enough. Um, let's drop down and look at land application, right? So you can't land a fly sludge, so that's a red box. You can do class B biosolids. That means you're treating it to a biosolid standard. I put that as yellow because we have PFAS problems at our land app sites. And by PFAS problems, I mean we have a chemical that we're using in our daily lives. Everyone's using it. Um, we're talking about perfluoroalkyl substances here. And these are most notably in uh, Teflon, Teflon pans. Also, anything that's water resistant, water repellent, stain resistance. So um, Scotch Guard, that's another classic name. Um, any anything that you've probably purchased that has stain guard in it has a PFAS coating applied to it. Um, it's also in a lot of cleaning products we're discovering, and we'll get into this a little later. But my point is, is that after multiple decades of land applying on the same field, we are finding that the soil and the groundwater could potentially become contaminated. And we do have in our state a groundwater standard for PFAS. So if we go and check the groundwater at a site and it's above that standard, then we cannot land apply there anymore. So unfortunately in the last, well, since 2019, the colleague Josh Burns and I have, um, well, we, we have not necessarily had to close them down necessarily, but we have had to uh, work with the municipalities and private entities running those to test them. And in many cases have had to say, we can't land apply here anymore. Um, it has resulted in a pretty dramatic decline in class B biosolids land application. If we go back and look at the stats, we're talking about 
uh, in state. Well, it's not going to be on this one, is it, Josh? No, it's not going to be. But I'd say we're. This is a combination of um, of of all recycling, so this does not pull out the class B, but it it is a very small percentage uh, relative to the 72 percent. It's probably at this point two facility, two fields in all of Vermont that are getting land applied class B biosolids. Um, I mean, we're just getting a vocabulary question. Can you just explain sure. the difference between class A and class B? Yeah, thanks. Good question. Thanks, so yeah. this is just the level of treatment that the sludge gets to either um, be pathogen light or pathogen basically free. Um, class B has been treated to a point where there are pathogens remaining, but it's at a level deemed safe for recycling. Those can only be done at, at places that have a site specific permit and they are heavily monitored. Um, and they include things like public access restriction, can't grow crops for human consumption. There's a lot of siting restrictions, a lot of operational restrictions. Um, but historically, it's been a pretty common way to manage biosolids in Vermont. And it's still going on in, in plenty of other states. Um, but we are seeing a, a, a pretty dramatic drop um, in some of the northeast states. In fact, Maine does not allow it anymore. Maine has a complete moratorium on land application of biosolids. Class A biosolids, we also in Vermont call them EQ or exceptional quality biosolids. Those have been treated to a higher level uh, where we have less pathogens. And at that point, the EPA and, and all the states have agreed that, well, the, the states are following the EPA, that this material is safe to basically use as fertilizer and to give away. So Class A biosolids are not done. They're not land applied under a specific permit. The permit is there for the treatment process only. Once it leaves the facility, it's basically fertilizer and not regulated. And that's consistent across all 50 states, with the exception of, again, of, of Maine, that doesn't allow any land application of biosolids at this time. Uh, and then, of course, we do have um, quite a bit of wastewater facilities that transfer sludge between, between them. You might have a small facility um, hauling sludge to a larger facility. I live in Burlington. There's three wastewater plants here. The two smaller ones haul sludge to the larger plant for processing. Um, Winooski also hauls, I believe, it's sludge to the Burlington main plant. So some of our larger facilities like Burlington, Montpelier, Rutland um, are taking sludges from other folks. Um, let's keep going. So what are we what are we looking at for challenges right now? Well, this is just a long list of stuff that's you know um, that creates obstacles and or challenges to managing these materials as um, at the landfill. And chief among that is capacity. We already hit on this. Uh, we've got dwindling landfill capacity across the region, um, not just New England, all the Northeast. Um, there was a pretty good Report done by the New New England Waste Management, uh, what is the OA New MOA, uh, that looked at sort of regional landfill capacity and um, put together an interesting report. I think I have a link to that report later. Um, we're hearing that our one active landfill ballpark lifespan left might be 2040. I think that's probably a bit of a moving target. But you know we have one land, landfill remaining in Vermont. There are other states that are in a similar position that may have just one or two landfills remaining. Um, as I said before, you know we can't just throw all the sludge in there because of the stability issue of mixing materials there. We've also got our municipalities competing for contracts with these landfills, and in some cases don't have one. In many cases, and for example, if you want to clean the sludge out of your lagoon. Um, and you call the landfill and say, I want to bring it there, they might not be able to take it, and you might now be calling the landfill in Franklin, New York, or you might be calling uh, the landfills in New Hampshire, or you might be calling somebody in Albany. So sludge is having to go further and further to be managed, which, which means just greater hauling distances and more money. It's costing a lot more to get rid of this material at the landfill. Um, you know, we do have historical odor challenges with these materials, and occasionally a landfill will turn away um, 
sludges, sludges loads because of odors. It's not too common, but it does happen. And then, of course, landfills are not a perfect solution. Um, this is organic material. We have an organics ban in Vermont on our landfill. We do not put food, food waste in the landfill. That's a great thing. It's been a long time coming. Um, but if we put um, sludge in the landfill, it does generate methane. Um, and nitrous oxide and other things like that, which are very potent greenhouse gases. Yes, there is landfill gas capture. No, it's not perfect. Um, and it's a pretty significant anthropogenic or human made source across the planet um, landfills. So uh, and then, you know, when you talk about the organic material decaying in the landfill and emitting um, you know, greenhouse gases, you're also, you also got to factor in the amount of trucking that goes on with hauling materials longer and longer distances to get to a landfill that will take it. Um, that's certainly um, an issue for climate, but it's also an issue for people who may be living around the landfill. Um, it's, you know, there's odor challenges, there's trucking, um, there's emissions from those. And of course, all landfills that are lined generate leachate. Um, and um, ironically, leachate uh, goes for treatment at wastewater treatment plants. So you're putting uh, sludge from a wastewater plant, driving it up to the landfill, collecting the water that comes out the bottom of the landfill and bringing it back to the treatment plant. So it makes quite a interesting closed loop there. Um, and uh, there is a pretty cool thing going on in Vermont right now where we are asking our landfill to pre-treat its leachate um, and that will strip out a lot of contaminants from that leachate making it um, a lot more amenable to going to the wastewater plants than it is now um, here's some stats um, i pulled these out of um, i think that numoa report um, and Josh uh, Kelly, who is our solid waste program manager, is on this call. So um, he may, after this presentation, validate or invalidate some of these numbers. Um, but, you know, certainly there's a lot of trash going to the landfill in Vermont. Uh, you're talking half a million tons there in 2021. 80% of that, uh, those tonnage was uh, municipal solid waste. 13% of that came from out of state. And really only 2,700 dry tons of wastewater sludge went there. So that's, that's not a lot from Vermont. It's really compared to the amount of material they take, it's a, it's a pretty small amount. They do take uh, sludges from uh, out of state. They take sludges from Massachusetts uh, for sure. And, um, you know, just as far as I know, uh, the state does not have any control over what, you know, what, how much sludge from what state um, the landfills take. These are private run facilities that make those decisions. Uh, and there's a reference to the new MOA uh, solid waste disposal capacity report. If you go to new MOA's website, um, you should be able to find it. If you still can't find it, you can uh, shoot me an email and I'll send it to you. Um, but it is pretty cool. It goes state by state um, and, and summarizes what's going on with all uh, landfill capacity in their states. Uh, we can skip over this one because we don't have sludge incineration in Vermont. Um, as I said, they're pretty far from here and, you know, they are not perfect either. Um, you've got air emissions for sure from these incinerators. They've done a, a, a much better job over the years, in particular with things like mercury, um, scrubbing these, filtering these air emissions before they go out. Um, that said, we are fairly confident based on some current EPA uh, research that sludge incinerators do not destroy PFAS. So um, there's a lot of interest in this topic and the EPA folks down in the uh, North Carolina area at their uh, research and development offices have been l literally burning PFAS in sewage sludge incinerator pilot level stuff in a lab and trying to figure out what's going on and what's being destroyed and what's not and what temperatures are being are, are hot enough to, to really cook PFAS and, and break it down. And so far, the, the, the take home from that is that it, it's not destroying PFAS. So unfortunately, that means it's going out the stack. So um, not a perfect solution by any means. Um, land application or beneficial use. 
Um, again, this is a fantastic way to close the loop. We're talking about recycling nitrogen, phosphorus, carbon, building soil health. Um, we're helping sequester carbon in soils every time we make soils healthier. And that is an excellent way of reducing the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Unfortunately, we have this PFAS that's in wastewater and it will concentrate in sludge and we put it on the ground. We can't have contamination issues. Um, we are still trying to understand what goes on when PFAS is on the ground, in the soil. How does it leach? How quickly, you know, are there any ways to mitigate that leaching to groundwater? There's crop uptake concerns. Um, this stuff does go into crops. It depends on the crop. It depends on the soil concentration. There is a lot of research to be done to understand this, and we are far from understanding what's going on with that. Um, and unfortunately, it's really fallen on Maine to do a lot of this work. Um, there has been some pretty dramatic stories in the media about farms that have been devastated from PFAS contamination. And we are not typically seeing levels that Maine sees in terms of contamination at our sites that we have investigated. Um, that doesn't mean we don't have problems because we cannot run a land application site if there's a groundwater problem. We just cannot do it. It's not within our rules. Um, what, is, what does that mean? It means there's a lot of uncertainty with doing a land application program. Um, it's not really the time as a municipality to be, you know, leaning too hard on a land application program because it could go away. Um, and we've got very uncertain regulations coming down the pipe from the EPA in the next couple years. And those regulations are going to get stricter. And those will translate from drinking water to groundwater because Vermont, like some many states, treats groundwater as a public trust that should be potable water. If you move to Vermont, build a home and put a well in, you're going to want to have clean water and you should. So uh, our groundwater standards mimic our drinking water standards. Um, let's talk about PFAS some more. So we tested a lot of sludges, class A biosols, class B biosols, some paper fiber. This came out of a study that we did in 2019 that's actually available on our website. These, these specific numbers aren't, but you can look at charts and charts, charts of PFAS data if you want. Um, and basically, you know, this would be um, an average of the PFAS levels in these materials. And this doesn't mean a lot to just say without some sort of relative uh, comparison here. Like, what does this really mean? OK, I've got 20 parts per billion PFAS in sludge. Well, it's hard to know what that really means. Um, I can tell you that the units on the y-axis are parts per billion and our standards in water are part per trillion. So you're talking about a thousand times higher than we have standards for in water. Um, and this is just the sum of the regulated PFAS in Vermont. Regulated PFAS include five compounds out of thousands. There are Amen, thousands can of you, PFAS. Can you uh, clarify something for me? If class A is exceptional quality, why are there more PFAS in that than in the class B? All right, thanks for the question. And let's hold those to the end, if you don't mind, so that I can get through this. Um, but I think that we're seeing a general trend in some of the PFAS testing. And I can't say for sure, but when you treat to class A, you're typically subjecting the material to higher temperatures. And it's usually a process um, that might be transforming certain precursors for PFAS, and I really don't want to get into PFAS chemistry in this talk, into terminal PFAS compounds we can measure in the lab. So the, the lab measures, let's say, 40 PFAS compounds, right, in their suite of compounds they test for. Um, if there's thousands of PFAS, and there are sort of parent compounds that will break down into the ones we can measure. 
that's what I think we're seeing here is we're seeing through the class A treatment process a breakdown of parent compounds into terminal compounds. It doesn't mean there's actually more PFAS in there. What it means is that we're measuring with the ones we can measure, there are more of. Is that, I hope that makes sense. Um, and I don't know that I would take this, you know, this is not a statistical comparison. So the difference between 20 and 40 in this data set might be, not in, you know, it's, it might not be a statistical difference. But I think if we sort of look across some larger data sets, we might see this trend of a of little bit higher numbers. And that has nothing to do with the total mass. It has only to do with the compounds we're measuring in the laboratory. And somehow there are more compounds that we can measure showing up in class A due to some treatment process. Um, in fact, the laboratories now do an analysis. They've been doing it for a while where they take your sample and they oxidize it and they expose it to an oxidation process. And if you look at your sample analyzed regularly versus analyzed after the oxidation process, you will see dramatic differences in your results typically. So that's very likely what we're seeing here. It's just a transformation of compounds. Um, here's a summary of, uh, and I apologize again for all the numbers. We have been testing a lot of land application sites in Vermont. And what we're finding here is that there's some good news and some not good news. The good news is the bottom row. We have not had a single drinking water well impacted that we have tested. We've tested a lot. Uh, we've tested nearly every well within a quarter mile of any land application site. Um, the not so good news is that we've got, you know, detects in groundwater well above our standard. Um, and again, this is most of our municipal uh, and even our private land application sites are multiple decades old. They've been operating for a long time. So over the years, like I can't say, no one can say what was put on the ground in the 1990s, right? We just, or the 1980s, like we just don't know what someone may have taken, uh, what their sort of sludge levels look like for PFAS. We really don't know. Um, but I can tell you that in the case of the most, I think it's the most famous, I would say, and I don't know if I'd say famous is the right word, but the Arundel farm in Maine um, that made the press, um, they have, for example, in the very center of box there, our average Vermont 5 PFAS in soils, 13.9. The vast majority of that is a single compound, PFOS. It's a very commonly found type of PFAS that was mass produced along with PFOA, which is the other big one. So that's the compound that contaminated the entire town of Bennington. PFOS is a very sticky PFAS that likes to cling in soil. So we see it in soil wherever we look, really. In fact, if any one of you were to go out right now in your backyard and take a shovel and take a sample and send that off to the lab, you'd probably see some PFOS in it. And I'd say, for comparison's sake, that might be one part per billion in your backyard background from aerial emissions of PFAS around the globe. And Vermont, we're at 13.9 times background, while Maine was at a thousand times. That that farm has a thousand parts per billion or one part per million PFOS by itself, not even counting all the other compounds. And they took some very specific waste that contained um, coated paper processing. And you can imagine your Dixie ware from your backyard picnic and your paper plate that has a coated material on it. Well, now that's what we're talking about here. Things that are water resistant. So um, what has this meant? This has meant that we've closed a lot of land application sites in Vermont. Um, and, you know, we do have detections in groundwater. It varies significantly. Um, some sites, we don't see much contamination. Others, we see significant contamination. So we're still trying to understand why we see the variety of levels we see, but I think a lot of it is, could be uh, attributed to the length of time the site has been used, which makes sense. Um, so what are we going to do about this? Because we've got, we've got a problem. We've got, we're all generating sludge every day. 
treatment plants are getting it every day. There's no choice. You can't shut that off. Um, we've got PFAS in there. We know we do. We don't want to put it all in the landfill. We probably can't put it all in the landfill. Um, we want to be able to recycle it, but we've got this problem when we recycle it. So we're really in a tough spot. Uh, and we've known about this for several years, and we're trying to take some steps at the state level to find a path forward where we don't prohibit the recycling of this material, but we do it where we've mitigated risk to the best extent possible at this point. So we first did in 2020 update to our rules, and that included PFAS testing for the first time. So we may have been the first state to require PFAS testing in this, any of this material. So we're, we're building some more knowledge there. Um, anybody running a land app site who's lucky enough to still have one, is doing a lot of groundwater testing. A lot of it's not cheap. This is very expensive testing, um, and uh, those folks who are making uh, Class A or exceptional quality biosolids are testing those before they leave the facility. Um, and as we alluded to earlier, once you make an exceptional quality or a Class A biosolid and you distribute it from your facility you are basically uh, off the hook for following it, tracking it, dealing with it in any way. It's it's really an unrestricted commodity at that point. Um, and, and here in Vermont, we think that's that we probably need to make some changes. Um, we at the state really need to know where this material is going. And so we are, over the next course of the next year, likely going to start uh, with an interim strategy where we basically try to track Class A biosolids. And it's not going to be super easy, but we're going to try and we're going to do our best. Um, it will require testing, which is already being done. And, and generally, I think what we're trying to uh, ensure is that we don't have repeated applications uh, with PFAS containing material on the same field over and over and over and over again. Um, so, we will probably likely say um, if you don't use it in an ag agricultural use to grow crops, that's great. We're not going to restrict it, but we're going to say this is probably something that you should be thinking about doing. Um, and then, of course, you know, this is waste management, waste management. Um, and you see the challenges with this. This is not going to change the PSAP PFAS levels in this material by just testing it. So we really, as a society, have a lot of work to do to figure out how to keep it out of the wastewater in the first place. And we could do an entire seminar just on this. Um, we have taken some steps in Vermont. We do have an industrial pretreatment program in Vermont. It's run by the state. In other states that are bigger, it's run by the municipalities. Um, we can permit industrial users who are likely or have, who we know have PFAS in their effluent, we can permit it and limit it. Um, that would be called pretreatment, but um, there's also pollution prevention practices that we as a state need to learn more about and work with our municipalities to help them understand how to communicate that to the, their users on their systems and uh, in general the public. And Part of that might include, for example, figuring out which industries in your town might be might be contributing PFAS. Um, Vermont is wrapping up a pollution prevention grant we got in 2020 to work with the metal finisher um, industries in Vermont, so some of the biggest. Uh, and the good news is, is we really didn't find a lot of PFAS in their processes. Um, so that's that's very encouraging because um, many years ago, Michigan, where there's a lot of chrome plating, discovered extremely high levels of PFAS in their wastewater plants and had to go out and, and set up a strategy to, to deal with that. And it doesn't look like Vermont is going to need to do that, which uh, which is lucky for Vermont. The other thing we've already talked a little bit about is sort of. How is PFAS used and what products is it in? Um, and this is a tough one. It is used, it is such an, an, a, from a strictly chemistry standpoint, a very, very functional chemical 
that has a lot of applications um, and typically is not disclosed that it's in that product. Um, and there's reasons for that we don't need to get into now, but um, we are learning uh, about the widespread use. It's truly incredible how many products contain this stuff. And one of the reasons that we have legislative bans and prohibitions is because we've learned that there are some things that certainly have PFAS in them that we don't want it in there anymore. And as a state, we've recently done bans on PFAS and ski waxes, carpets, uh, your firefighting foams, which is a major source of PFAS and probably the number one source of contamination across the globe PFAS wise, other than maybe the actual manufacturing plants. Um, there's probably not a single airport in the country, a main airport that has not used firefighting foam. They were required to test with it and nobody told them, hey, that foam has got chemicals in it that are one day going to be <laughs> regulated and cause contamination. So um, that includes Vermont. Our two main airports uh, certainly have PFAS contamination. We're working with those. Um, we're working on those sites now. A lot of investigation going on. Um, and from what I understand, uh, there have been some pretty major impacts from airports uses and military bases of, of firefighting foam. There's, um, but Vermont, fortunately, there has not been major impacts. We're, um, again, I think dodging a pretty nasty bullet on, on firefighting foam for the most part, although there's still plenty of work to do. So um, we talk about pretreatment pollution prevention, and one thing we wanted to do was sort of figure out if we could work with the municipalities to really develop some sort of investigation, uh, investigative way to try to find PFAS that's coming into the wastewater system and to shut that valve down or off. Um, and what we did was we worked with uh, Middlebury, we worked with Essex Junction, and we went around to the sewer uh, system and strategically sampled in places where we thought we could isolate certain sectors of the um, town. For example, uh, a pump station on the sewer that serves a neighborhood only with no known industrial or commercial inputs. Uh, we also were able to work with a couple of industrial facilities that had direct discharges to sample them. Um, and Basically, it's a pretreatment strategy, uh, and this is something that we hope that can be repeated in other towns. Um, I just threw this up there to indicate that where there are red arrows, um, those are predominantly residential areas. So this is not just an industrial problem. PFAS is coming out of everybody's homes, and it's making its way down to the treatment plants. So again, we all contribute sludge and likely we're all contributing PFAS to the system. So we all have a vested interest in figuring this out together. Um, and I'm not gonna talk any more about this, um, this chart because it just gets a little confusing, um, but we were pretty surprised to learn that um, it's likely that residential inputs are as significant or in some cases more significant uh, than what we would probably have expected compared to industrial sources. And Amen, there, sorry, this is Josh. Um, yeah. there's, a, there's a chart that shows testing of products for PFAS that I can share if you want, um, but maybe it's in your presentation as well. And it's generally textiles that had the high level from landfill bound waste that was tested. Yep. So when we wash our clothes, folks, that's what we're talking about here. And and if your clothes are stain resistant, you're excited that your sweater didn't get the stain when you dripped wine on it. And and that excitement is a little tamped down now um, because when you wash that sweater, that's where it goes. So anyway, thanks. Yeah, and, we're, and I said, you know, we're still learning about that. Josh is referencing um, Casella and, and their consultant did a pretty amazing thorough uh, sampling program of materials coming to the landfill to try and understand sort of what are their significant sources of PFAS coming to the landfill. And Josh is right. Textiles was a very significant source. I don't know if it was necessarily 
just clothing or if it included other things like, you know, when you throw out your couch cushion or you throw out your old tent or whatever you're throwing away, I got to think carpets has got to be a very, very significant source. I have purchased carpet for my home, second floor of my home in 2014. DuPont stain master carpet wall to wall. <laughs> so I didn't know anything about PFAS. Um, and I am certainly exposed on some level to PFAS through the carpet. Um, household dust is a major exposure pathway for PFAS. If you're not drinking it, which most people are not, uh, I'd argue that probably most Vermonters are not for sure. Um, then your probably second level of exposure is probably either your household dust or products you're putting straight on your body. So cosmetics um, is a big one, um, pretty high concentrations. And um, there's a lot more work coming out on that, but let's, let's keep going. Uh, this is basically a fancy gra uh, way of showing how much work we did. Um, so each one of these circles represents a sampling location in Essex Junction. And just to point out again that like if you look up in the top and you see PCP1, PCP2, those are industrial facilities that are discharging that did have, we, we expected to have fine PFAS there and we did. But when you look at that circle in the middle, if I was able to actually scale these appropriately, that circle in the middle would be five times the size it is now. And that is the amount coming from a residential pump station. So 300 homes that all drained in their sewers to one little pump station that we sampled. So kind of unexpected for us, for sure. Um, Josh had already started to talk about this, right? So where are the major sources? Um, apparently food packaging. Um, and that is something I think we're gonna see change here pretty quickly with hopefully consumer pressure um, saying basically, we wanna see PFAS free packaging. Um, it's going to be a big push, but I think it's low hanging fruit. That's my opinion. Um, if, if you, for example, like me, used to go to Dunkin' Donuts, uh, and get your, your coffee and it came in styrofoam. Now it comes in paper that's coated. Um, am I throwing Dunkin' Donuts under the bus? No, I actually don't know if Dunkin' Donuts has any PFAS in any of their packaging, but certainly McDonald's, Burger King, Chick-fil-A, everybody else, even your, uh, healthier, um, faster food places, um, have PFAS in their packaging. Where does packaging go? Into the garbage, but also uh, into us if the food is in contact with that. Um, Vermont, I left it off my list here somehow. It didn't make the list at the very bottom there on next to ski waxes and carpets, but food packaging is on that list. And there are many states that are jumping on the food packaging PFAS ban bandwagon um, for good reason, right? So uh a gentleman made this who's a big biosolids guy and yeah of course biosolids are the one at the bottom here with the little tiny sliver um you know this is just put out there to show that basically you know we're also not really exposed to biosolids as people um so very low risk to human health here for biosolids doesn't mean it doesn't create environmental challenges when we talk about recycling them. Um, this is another very interesting study that came out of New Hampshire very recently. This is the levels of PFAS found in 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 floor or the mop slop buckets after cleaning the floors at schools. Makes a lot of sense to me. Schools are dirty. There's kids running everywhere, spilling everything on everything, and they clean the floors every night. And they put a new uh, coat of wax on, they strip it off, they put a new coat of wax on. And when they take their mop bucket and or they get out there, drive their little fancy thing around that, you know, that cleans the floor. If they take that and they don't dispose of it properly, it is a very high levels of PFAS. And unfortunately, if you've got a septic tank on your school and you've got a drinking water well nearby it, chances of contaminating that well are significant. Um, we have seen a couple of cases that we in Vermont where we think that's likely the what happened. Um, New Hampshire is finding it for sure. Um, 
same for commercial carpets. When you have commercial carpet cleaner come in and clean the carpets, I know some of those guys do, do go to wastewater plants. Um, very small volume, so unlikely to be a, a large mass of PFAS associated with that, but very high levels. Um, so I'm going to try and wrap up here in the next five minutes. Um, I just wanted to tell you guys about some ongoing projects that we're working on. Um, first and foremost is Vermont is now testing 500 private wells across the state for PFAS. Um, and we're about a quarter of the way through that. Um, and I can't tell you anything about it because it's part of an ongoing lawsuit by the state against chemical manufacturers of PFAS. Uh, it's a way of determining um, what is the impact across the state to private drinking water wells, which is groundwater. Um, it's a pretty important study. Um, we are also, um, speaking of food packaging, uh, going to be embarking on another pollution prevention grant looking at PFAS and food waste. We're also going to be looking at microplastics in that waste. And this came out of, of some concerns uh, from waste managers and, and, and the legislature. Um, we do have one food depackager in Vermont, and um, there were concerns about levels of microplastics in that waste. Um, but I think the state looked at it and decided, well, uh, there's plenty of food waste going not through, not as a result of depackaging, uh, but just through regular depackaging and, and also just through uh, organics management and diversion from the landfill. So we're going to be looking at that. Um, why would there be PFAS in food waste? Probably the packaging. Um, we are also going to be doing a comprehensive statewide PFAS uh, testing initiative at all of our wastewater plants, all municipal wastewater plants, 92 treatment plants over a couple of years. Um, and I think that's a great thing that Vermont's doing. Uh, other states that are a little bit more, um, the EPA uh, writes their permits for them, their discharge permits. They already have PFAS monitoring in their permits, their wastewater permits. And I think Vermont is is taking a, a, sh uh, a, a better, shorter step and saying, okay, let's not just put a, a monitoring condition in a permit because we can let's go see if we have a problem so there we're going to be doing some quarterly sampling at wastewater plants uh sort of take a look at that data set after a phase one and then we're going to be looking at a uh, um pulling all that data out and through a phase two project going to go work with specific municipalities to try and do some of the work we talked about earlier which is the pre-treatment pollution prevention work hopefully get enough of these models rolling as a template where we can have our municipalities start to go, OK, we can go look in our town. We can do what Middlebury did. We can do what the state did with us down in whatever town we want to call it. And and we can keep an eye on things. Um, we're also going to be doing a statewide septage capacity study. I mentioned that. Um, really excited for that one. I've been hoping to do it for a couple of years now. Um, we are continuing to do surface water and fish tissue testing in across Vermont. Um, Part of that has to do with determining whether do we need a surface water standard for PFAS? Who would that impact? Most likely our wastewater treatment facilities because they're the ones that are have effluent limits determined by surface water standards. Um, also for potential fish consumption concerns. I live right next to Lake Champlain. Um, plenty of mercury in the fish in Lake Champlain. And um, there are some areas uh, of this country where they have fish tissue consumption advisories from due to PFAS. Um, will that happen in Vermont? I don't know. It's too early to tell. There's a lot of uh, data to bring in still. Uh, of course, we're doing a lot of uh, contaminated sites response still. Uh, as I said, the airport is under um, quite a bit of uh, investigation, and that's in conjunction with obviously the uh, Department of Defense uh, and um, several schools that we tested a part of our, our public drinking water uh, testing. We've tested every public drinking water system in Vermont. Uh, and in response to some of the higher higher levels, we've had to go a little dig a little deeper at some of our smaller uh, water systems that are that are um, that are schools and other places to sort of understand what's going on. Um, I already alluded earlier to the cleaning product uh, issue. Uh, it's likely that's a problem. Um, could also be that 
there's a historic leach field or something that hasn't been accounted for uh, in the landscape. Um, siting of your well and your leach field are pretty important, not just for pathogens, but now we're learning uh, for other things like PFAS. Uh, and then there's lots of talk about model legislation, about states coming together as, as regions and doing legislation like you know food packaging bans, PFAS bans. Some states are talking about banning all PFAS and all products. Um, but it's very spotty. Each state's kind of running independently. So um, could we come together as a group uh, and, and do this as a whole to have a major impact? Because until you get California, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, all these other states to do these um, prohibitions and bans, uh, Little Vermont isn't going to make a lot of difference on its own. Um, we might be able to limit some things internally in the state, um, but we're PFAS is being produced on a global scale, right? So, you know, unless there's federal action, um, multiple state legislation kind of makes sense. Uh, so that's it for me and good, about an hour. So uh, thank you all for being patient and listening. And um, I will try to, or the group of us that's here, I'm sure can answer most of your questions if you have some. Thank you so much, Amen. Aaron, do you want to go ahead and ask a first question? Oh, you're still muted. OK, thanks. Good. Um, you can hear me now? Yes. OK, um, so kind of two things related to PFAS and land application of biosolids. Um, one, if there's no biosolid treatment capacity in state and we're sending it out of state to be treated and then it's just applied there where are the biosolids coming from that are being applied in state um and then as a follow-up and more of a conceptual question is it better to concentrate the land application in order to avoid contaminating um multiple sites with PFAS or 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 the dis or is the distribution of it like the having a low lower level everywhere better than just designating one landfill or or um you know hazardous waste site that that just has all all of the you know land applied biosolid um, and contaminates that's that site you know terribly but <laughs> it's all in one place. So there's two parts there. Uh, I think the first part was you're asking about generally where are biosolids that are being put on the ground for Vermont coming from, um, mostly from Vermont. Um, there are about eight facilities in Vermont that produce um, exceptional quality biosolids. There also there are um, some entities that have received approval to come to Vermont with their biosolids and I don't know if I put it in that slide and I should have, but an update to our 2020 rules required that anybody who wanted to bring um, biosolids into Vermont had to register with us. And basically what that meant was that when we reviewed it, it had the material had to meet Vermont's stricter standards. Or if the state that it was generated in had stricter standards in Vermont, it had to meet their standards. Um, so at first, that really meant there wasn't a lot of anything coming to Vermont being imported. But over the last couple of years, there's been a few folks who've gotten permission to come into Vermont. Um, and those amounts, I don't quite know yet, but I'm guessing that it's much less than what's being uh, put on the ground from Vermont facilities. Um, your second question, honestly, I really can't answer. I I don't foresee an option of dedicating an area that we're just willing to contaminate or just accept contamination um, and have it be some sort of regional land application area where we just put all this stuff. Um, I just don't see that as being feasible. Um, it would probably require some very serious um hydrogeological assessment 
of like what's the risk to groundwater is it an isolated uh you know aquifer is it shallow is it you know what are we what are we getting to here how far this stuff if there's a fracture in the bedrock can go miles so um it sounds pretty risky uh on some level i, I hate to say it but you know in the old say uh you know dilution uh of pollution or whatever you want to say right i mean we do essentially right discharge some level of pollution in our society and we've accepted that um, you know, there is no zero, right, when it comes to contaminants. So um, we accept a little bit of of contamination in our world for the sake of of who, what we are, right? We're consumers, and we generate some contamination. Um, but I do think overall, um, being thoughtful about where the material is being used, um, I think we may see a shift a little bit away from agricultural markets um you know there are other opportunities to use this material i think uh for example a, a revegetation for uh maybe a, a project a large project construction projects um things like that where you're really only using it to establish to provide a nutrient source to establish the vegetation and it's a one-time use and you're pretty much done right and also ensuring that we're testing that material to make sure it's not heavily contaminated that it's sort of your typical levels um so i don't think i answered that very well but you did point out a very challenging uh you know aspect of managing biosolids thanks amen did you want to stop sharing your screen or you maybe want to pop back to slides i, I we figured i might questions. need it again okay great um we had questions anybody from wayne elliott i think that came out when you were showing the slide with the different um, colors for the different types of bios. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sludges. Uh, how do you think these changes or may affect those facilities that compost? So maybe how do the challenges affect? Yeah, I mean, I assume Wayne means the compost uh, folks that are composting to make a Class A biosolid, okay. um, not our not our um, our organics composters. Um, you know, I think anybody making biosolids right now, this is impacting them. Um, one thing that I've, you know, composting is typically one of the less energy intensive and costly ways to get there. Um, it works, right? Composting works. Um, it breaks down pathogens and you don't have to run it through some high intensity energy process. Um, but you are adding material uh, you're bulking sometimes 50%. So you're having to move more material um, versus um, if you were to say put in a sludge dryer and dry to 90%, yeah, you've got a considerable less amount of material to manage. And um, there's advantages to that. No matter what pathway you go, whether you do landfill it or reuse it, you're just dealing with less materials, uh, which is gonna save you money on trucking and require less space to manage the material in general. Um, but I don't know, um, you know, there's the largest biosolids composting facility is in Maine, Hawk Ridge, um, and they have a prohibition. You can't put anything that, they, anything that they make there, they can't put on the ground in Maine. They've got to export all of it. Um, I don't know how that's going. <laughs> can't be awesome um but yeah tough question thanks wayne john desaro asked is it being reviewed for the sludge to be entered into farm digesters uh so sludge does not go to farm digesters um it's it's digested at the treatment facility um they have their own anaerobic digesters and and so, not all cases for sure but many of the treatment plants have them um if sludge was to be brought to an on farm digester um anything that go went into that digester would now be subject to rules pertaining to sludge and pot solids um so typically it's not been a good idea um because everything that comes out of that digester at that point is considered sludge um, or biosolids that have to be managed. And your typical digester is not going to achieve class A. It's going to be a class B, 
which requires a site-specific permit, land area, and you've got a liquid and a solids component now to manage. So you could extract the energy, which is great, um, but you're still left with a material that's now a solid waste versus you're treating manure on, on your own arm farm digester. Uh, that's I don't believe that's solid waste. I could be wrong. But, um, uh, I don't think that means you can't use sludge in a digester. And I think if you had the right model, it might work. It's certainly an energy source. It's a reliable source. It's a reliable feedstock. Um, it has had a lot of the energy value taken out of it through the wastewater treatment plant process, depending on the process. Um, but it is a very reliable feedstock. And um, if you were to tack on an additional treatment on the back of an anaerobic digester, you'd be in better shape. Thanks, Amen. Bob Protovansky asks, is there any alternative to disposing of grit other than the landfill? We send probably 40 dumpsters a year to the landfill, guessing. I'm not aware of another use for that material. Um, I don't know if, if um, Josh or do Josh Kelly, do you have it? Uh, well, I just don't know if he means uh, wastewater grit or yes. if he means drinking water grit. There, he means wastewater All right. grit. All right, fair, fair. Um, yeah. Okay, then let's hear from John Malter has his hand raised next. Thanks, Emma. Emma, I was, I was kind of curious on the, uh, the uh, Coventry Landfills pre-treatment uh, program for their leachate pilot study. What kind of levels are you seeing on that? And with the Coventry Airport nearby, has there been any background stuff done to tell us what kind of background might be adding to uh, what people up in that neck of the woods are, you know, pointing their fingers at the landfill? Um, so I can certainly not answer all that question. Um, you know, there's PFAS, elevated levels of PFAS and leachate, um, just through the nature of the landfill taking all the stuff we already talked about it trickles down um it's very compound specific like I, I talked about pfos being a compound that tends to stick to stuff well it's no different in landfill it's almost like a a repository for pfos there's been some interesting work to show that mass balance wise that more pfos will go in than come out of a landfill and leachate so it can it can sit in there and it kind of just stays soil is pretty much the same thing but you get all the other PFAS out into leachate in addition to a myriad of other things. We don't even know that's what's in there, right? Uh, keep in mind through all this that, like, we're seeing a glimpse of when you talk about emerging contaminants, we don't know what all that stuff is and what it means. So it's really at the cutting edge of understanding what these things do and how they behave. Um, I think the pretreatment permit is a great idea. It's a way to capture... It's a concentrated waste stream. It's a way to catch this stuff and get it out of there before we recycle it as water back to the treatment plants. Um, it always kind of shocked me that leachate went to the wastewater treatment plants, but there's really, that's what happens in this world. And I think there's other states that are doing a similar thing. I think it's great. I don't know where they're at in the project. I'm not running that project. Um, it's being done by our pretreatment program. Um, but it's not the first of its kind. It can be done. Um, someone asked from Brandon Wastewater about activated carbon. Yes, granular activated carbon can remove PFAS from just about anything, um, but it's a filter, and all filters clog at some point. It's a finite treatment system, kind of like your, if you've got a fancy fridge and you got a carbon filter, eventually your water starts to taste funny again. Oh, the little light went on. I got to change, throw the stupid thing away and spend another 50 bucks on another one, right? It's no different. They work. You put them in and uh, after a while, the PFAS breaks through or it clogs or something like that. I don't know enough about how great GAC systems are for wastewater, but I'm going to guess <laughs> it's not it's a great not idea. So, and there are other potential technologies out there. 
for treating PFAS in various matrices. Uh, ion exchange, um, reverse osmosis will do it. Um, there's all these fancy uh, technologies that are coming out, right? There's a there's a demand, so there will be a supply of technologies to treat and 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 surely water, and followed by probably other matrices. Um, but wastewater is a tough one. Um, I would argue that focusing upstream is going to be much more efficient from a pollutant removal and an economic standpoint. Um, although I'm, that's my opinion. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, and I believe the leachate system proposed is running on granulated act granulated activated carbon, but I'm not sure. Um, no, but I, it, I, I don't. Not, that there's there. Well, there's a lot of confusion because there's an under drain that's going to run on GAC granulated oh, activated you. carbon, and that's um, an under drain that has in, indices of of PFAS in it, but it's not showing a signature of leachate in any other way. Um, so that will be GAC, and that that is pretty pretty effective because it's just targeting really one compound or or one set of chemical suite. Um, the the pretreatment exploration is more of those other things you were talking about reverse osmosis at least from what i'm aware they are exploring several things and the wastewater program is really heading up that pretreatment as yeah. far as john malter's other question about the airport i'm not aware i wonder if uh some of our sites colleagues who have done the statewide testing for pfos probably been involved with that airport i don't know what they got for numbers um, I mean, I guess just to put a fine point on it right now, in terms of the Coven, the landfill in Coventry and Coventry News VT, um, the leachate is tankerized and then tanker trucked out to treatment plants that are not there. So that's what's happening with that right now. Um, the only PFAS that that really is is showing up is that under drain that we're talking about that a, a treatment system is going on for GAC. So, but I think there's another hand up, Emma. Uh, let's see who's the gentleman. Um, Bob Fisher. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> um, so my question is, first of all, I'd like to thank you for this excellent presentation. This is really, really well done. Um, and 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 the Bar and DEC and the Department of Ag for uh, you know following the science. Um, my my question is basically with uh, septage. Um, PFOS, do you have any data on PFOS levels in septage? I assume that it's somewhat concentrated. Um, the also concern is that right now the Senate uh, Environment and Public Works Committee is looking at CERCLA de designation. Uh, if PFOS is designated under CERCLA, um, my concern is if you are a municipality taking in septage, obviously once PFOS becomes under, it becomes under CERCLA, you would be you could, I don't know what you would do about your taking it in um, through the influent, but taking in septage, on the other hand, if it then becomes a, a, a poisonous chemical, um, I'm not sure that that wouldn't violate your license as a wastewater operator to take in a known pollutant um, into the state. That's just my personal opinion. But um, the, um, my question is septage. What's the, what's the uh, deal with, you know, and once again, Household dust is ten to sixty thousand, and right, this is, is a very dangerous chemical, but it it is very ubiquitous. And blood levels are over a thousand. Someone actually said that to me. If it becomes under CERCLA, how does the Red Cross possibly move it around? Because if it were to crash, anyway, that's my question about septage. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, um, interesting perspective there on yes. Um, I think if you start talking about sludge and you know, it's a very easy place. Residual materials are a great place to look for contaminant du jour, any contaminant that you want to find, because this is the residuals of our life that are found at the treatment plants. And um, they get a lot of attention and they're easily studied and they are heavily studied. Um, and yeah, when you start talking about levels in sludge relative to levels in your blood, it, it's an interesting comparison. Um, so septage is a challenging um, matrix um, to analyze for PFAS. Um, that sounds like a lame excuse, but the laboratories have historically struggled with the analyses. So 
we, when we talk about analyzing water, it's a relatively easy thing for them to do. And what happens is the cleaner the matrix for them to analyze, the lower they can detect PFAS reliably. Um, we're talking down to one to two parts per trillion for water. It's pretty incredible. Um, you know, sludges, soils, we're talking a thousand times higher parts per billion, one part per billion. So the, that just shows you the variety in the lab's ability to analyze. Septage is somewhere in the middle between right, water and sludge. Um, but what typically happens is it just kind of makes the instruments not go bonkers, but there's a lot of noise in the signal and they are, have difficult time quantifying levels of PFAS due to the noise in, this, in, this, in the interference in the sample. Um, that's all I know, Bob, and I just know that we have not had much success analyzing septage. I know there's some uh, other states have gotten uh, samples here, sample there. Um, it seems like a very unreliable testing method at this point, and I'm really hesitant to draw any real opinions on what are the levels in septage because the lab, the lab analysis is so unreliable. Um, for example, if we analyze dewatered sludge, 80%, 90%, we get really good detection limits at the at the laboratory and we get some pretty good results reliable results results they're confident in if we start talking about analyzing two percent sludge it gets weird quick and you're going to see detection levels where they're going to say well it's less than 200 well that doesn't really help us because we it's probably in there it could be anywhere from just above zero to 200 199 we don't know where it is um, there's certainly plenty of work to be done. We do have some limited septage data. It mostly comes out of our contaminated site works where we've actually gone in and looked at uh, septage where we've had a drinking water system impacted and we want to see if it came from the septic tank. The data is all over the place. So a lot of work to be done in that area. If you find a national repository of septage data, let me know. Eamon and everybody who's here, this is the slide I was talking about that I wanted to share. Eamon, is this coming up for you? Can you see yep, this? I see it. OK, um, so this is uh, uh, we often refer to it as the landfill in Coventry, but technically it's uh, New England Waste Services of Vermont News VT. Um, this is uh, testing the waste stream for PFAS. You can notice Eamon talked about carpets. He's exactly right. The different colors are different PFAS compounds and textiles and carpets and bulky waste, which is generally your couch, your your lazy boy recliner, um, is where you're seeing those high concentrations. Um, notably, sludge is notably lower, um, quite a bit lower from these three. Um, so I'll just note that, but it is indicating that the waste coming in um, are part of the contributing factor to that leachate that we've discussed here today. So um, yeah, so I think the uh, the prohibitions that are going in through the Department of Health uh, that actually take effect in what, two more days or a day, uh, um, July 1st, uh, 2023 is the ban on many products that contain PFAS and the legislature tried a, an additional bill to expand the list of products as well. I don't know where that bill went, um, but I would expect they'll probably be back at it again this year talking about that topic, so. Thanks, Josh. Yeah. Yeah, and Thanks. that study is great I because it, it shows everything as grams per day. And so you're not just looking at concentrations here, right? Because that's important. We can talk about carpet waste being really concentrated in PFAS. But if if you're a treatment plan and the guy shows up with 10 gallons, are you going to be worried about 10 gallons? Maybe not, right? But if it's versus you're getting 10,000 gallons a day or 50, and you've got PFAS in it at a lower concentration, well, that mass might be higher or lower. So we're talking about loading when we're talking about mass. We're not talking about concentration. So this is a cool chart because it's actually showing not just concentrations, but amounts of material. If they weren't taking a lot of, of textiles in, that number would be a lot lower, that, that bar. So um, anyway, someone was talking and I interrupted you, I apologize. 
No, it was me. Thank you. I, I, I just wanted to thank you for that. It's excellent presentation. And my concern, obviously, is that down the line, if there was regulations on it, and certainly me in South Burlington, if I were to take in a lot of septage and then there were regulations, I'm obviously jumping ahead here. And I then violated and I took it from outside of South Burlington and the South Burlington residents then had to pay X because of what I did. That seems unwise. Thank you. Yeah, I hear you. And I think there's a lot, a lot of uh, concern around the circle designation. Um, I, I know that all of the various water and wastewater um, nonprofits and, and industries have, you know, gone through their government contacts to try to make sure that there's an exemption for these public sectors. I can give my opinion, but I won't. But I'm, you know, I work right alongside you guys. I kind of know how... <laughs> I know what you do. It's probably in terms of wastewater. We all talk about this. It's one of the most incredible things that goes on in this world. It's an incredible public health success. Um, you get dumped on literally in the press all the time. Um, no one talks about the 364 days out of the year where there wasn't an upset or a problem or you didn't get a bad load or the valve didn't blow or the chlorine pump, the chlorine sagged or whatever you got, whatever that term is you guys use. I hate that chlorine sag term. Anyway, uh, you know, you don't get any credit. And um, and to top it off, you all get to talk, think about PFAS now. I don't, I don't, I have full sympathy for the water and wastewater sector. Um, and it's why, uh, it's why I, I like this job that, that, that we all do this together. And I do it, don't, don't do it because I love PFAS. That's for sure. Um, I, I think the circle of stuff's going to be wild. I, I really do hope that the federal government comes up with a reasonable approach. There's actually a big circle training coming up. I don't know enough, but I'm going to attend it and pretend to be a lawyer for a couple hours. Thanks, Eamon. Um, thank you so much. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Bob's all set. We had a, a public health question. I don't know if anyone knows um, from Shannon Chiquette, but maybe that's actually Corey. At NEK, it says, looks like women who typically wear makeup are in a big danger of exposure to PFAS since makeup use is usually daily. This is awful considering there are fewer medical studies that focus on women's health issues. Is our PFAS showing up in breast milk? I don't know if anyone has encountered. I would guess yes, but I don't yeah. know for sure. Um, yeah. It's interesting, though. It depends on that may the PFAS might depend on the specific compound. Um, this stuff does tend to w some of the contaminants in the world you think about sort of accumulating in fat. Uh, PFAS, I think, does more of a, a blood and and tissue type muscle type um, accumulation. Um, so it probably excretes a little quicker, which is good, um, as opposed to something that's going to accumulate in your body fat and stick around for for a long time. Um, that's the the interesting thing about the the cosmetics is that uh, a university very close to us Car is it Carleton is that right um, they're in Canada and on Ontario has been doing some pretty cool work on that so yet again um, the Northeast sort of being at the tip of the spear for PFAS research um, but they have come and talked to us before and I, and I do have um, I think they have a publication out I. If anybody wants to see it, you can reach out to me directly and I'll, I can get it for you. Hear from Harry Shepard has a hand raised. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I want to uh, commend him and everyone that's thought about pulling this together. I'm very encouraged to see 50 plus people participating in this. Uh, uh, as a producer of biosolids residuals, uh, uh, I want to uh, share with you folks here that uh, us in the water world are feeling extremely concerned about where all of this stuff is going. And I, I know that everyone on this call also has similar concerns. Uh, and Eamon's done a terrific job at kind of presenting where we're at uh, and I think I would just add that we're, we're all feeling like we don't have many tools in the toolbox and things are becoming so complicated so fast 
that we really do want to use this as an opportunity to springboard further discussions with the solid waste folks about the future. Um, and uh, for instance, uh, as an example, um, we think that we need more input into the material management plan. And, uh, and we really need to recognize that we have a problem that needs higher level uh, solutions. Um, and hopefully we could figure out a way, whether it's through the, you know, bigger municipal waste water treatment systems that maybe have more capacity to handle sludges and biosolids, or if it's with regional facilities with our, uh, you know, solid waste districts or, uh, or, you know, more regionalization like we all probably hope for. Um, we think that that this is at a point where we really need to raise the level of awareness somehow, primarily, I guess, with our legislators. Uh, and we want to be working together with you guys to try to figure out the best approach on that because uh, um, it's becoming critical. And thank you again for posting this, Eamon, and, and the solid waste folks. Yeah, Harry, let me just jump in. This is Josh Kelly. I am the solid waste program manager, and with staff here, we will be uh, working with Eamon's group to draft the 2024 Vermont Materials Management Plan, or solid waste plan, as it's formally known. Um, it does have a section on residuals. I feel the pressure that wastewater treatment and septage haulers are under, and it's not a comfortable place to be. Um, this past legislative session, um, the solid waste districts did a lot of work, alliances and also independent towns did a lot of work together to testify on the high cost and toxicity of household hazardous waste. And they got a law that helps pay them um, for some of their services by producers of those products. Um, I don't know of a solution in this realm that is, is I'm not even going to say that that household hazardous waste producer responsibility was easy, but at least there was a way to go about it and they were successful and uh, the governor even signed that bill into law. So that so I guess there is an ability for listening at the legislature. Um, Eamon and I are just kind of cogs in the wheel. We we work for the, you know, the executive branch um, uh, under our boss, Matt Chapman, but um, it's not lost on us this challenge that you're under. And um, the legislators are listening. I mean, I, I see colleagues here from Agency of Agriculture who has some concerns. It's a it's a societal. I think it's a societal issue issue, and um, we can't just blast off a rocket and make it go away. <laughs> the the residual materials. So if we could, maybe that would solve some of it. But it's not that simple. So um, yeah, keeping some close to home has pluses and minuses, but turning off the taps is also really really important. I am. I am optimistic about what Department of Health has done with their PFAS ban, um, but I know I know that more is going to need to be done. That it's just scratching the surface. Um, so I think we're all in it together. Is I guess what I can say at this moment. Eamon, anything you wanted to say there? No, I think that was great. Um, I really appreciate everybody coming. I was glad to see such a good turnout, and um, I know this didn't necessarily. This is, we're not really proposing solutions um, because, as we all know, there really aren't solutions right now. Um, but, um, you know, this is sort of the state of the state. And um, this is not just Vermont problem, as I said at the beginning. Um, if there's a state that doesn't think this isn't a problem, they have their head in the ground, uh, they're, they're head in the sand, whatever the metaphor is. Um, but the, the, New England, the, the New England states are... <laughs> the New England states are certainly um, seeing very similar things across the board and facing similar challenges. Um, for example, we, you know, we did a background soil study in Vermont in 2019. We may have been the first state um, and published it and we kind of went, well, I think we're pretty confident in it. And then Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, all the states followed and got pretty much the same results. Um, so, you know, that was good to see, uh, that we weren't on the, on the wrong path and, um, 
it also just goes to show the sort of scale of of the background level, right? And so, um, at some, on, on so it's sort of sad to say, but this stuff is here to stay, um, and we are sort of going to have a background level no matter what we do, most likely. Um, and we got to be careful that we don't end up in a position where we're creating regulation that is unattainable, um, not just economically, but like practically. I mean, it's you can't. Is it appropriate to have to ask for a standard below a background level? What are we talking about now? This is now we're getting into very dangerous gray areas. So I think we're trying to be slow and thoughtful in how the how we do this. Um, especially with residual materials. Um, and I hope that we can stay that course. Um, knee jerk reactions are not going to help anybody right now. Um, but we do need to find a path forward because status quo is probably not working and prohibitions don't work when it comes to residuals. You can't just ban something and make it go away. It's not going away. And I would argue it's pretty irresponsible to say we, we're not going to allow that material to be here, but you can set it somewhere else. Um, Again, that's kind of an opinion, but so uh, again, thanks for being here. Um, I think we're at over four and um, I could talk about this all day, but I don't really want to. So <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks, Amy and Emma, you want to take it out? Can, can I just yeah, make so, one? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, comment. John. I'm sorry. Uh, this has been great. Really appreciate it. But the dialogue's begun. I hope we continue this dialogue with the players that are here and perhaps others that are uh, that are going to be as, in, essential to this whole thing. And I just want that to be one of the focuses moving forward, because this is really a good start, but it's certainly not an ending. Yeah, thanks for that, John Malter. Let me just point out, this is one of the first meetings I've ever been to where wastewater managers are at the table with solid waste managers across the state. And I can't tell you how many times we uh, solid waste managers forget about what the work our wastewater uh, uh, brothers and sisters are doing out there. You know, this is these are these are people in very similar positions, municipal officials. So. Um, the state has an obligation to talk about these wastes every five years and to set a plan. Eamon and I have those charges on our shoulders with our staff and our teams. And then we go out and write something that um, we submit to you, the public, for comment that dictates what the state and the municipalities are going to do around these wastes. And let me just say one thing occurs to me is that is that drying sludge is ships less water. That helps everybody no matter where it's going. Um, so, you know, there are some minor nibbles around the edges of infrastructure that may help in the long run that all costs money as our as our wastewater folks know so i think there's some thoughts we can have um but i think more dialogue is needed and input um and we we don't have buckets of money here um either so we're, we've got some challenges ahead of us but um but i think it's important for these conversations to continue and i thank Eamon and the and the residuals program for being here today this is part of the 2019 materials management plan pfos really hit us during this plan well, hit us sideways i mean Eamon's really could talk about it ad nauseum more but it's been day in day out emerging so um we're going to continue on these this topics i believe in the next plan um, and, and hopefully we can get some feedback from you on, on what other things would be helpful. So I think that's just sort of a stay tuned for next time and, and more stuff coming out of a, uh, the state. And I will be sending out the recording and the um, PowerPoint to my list serve and then Eamon will also distribute it. So thank you all for being here. Yeah, thanks Emma. All right, we'll let everybody have a good afternoon. Take care, everybody.